Kenobi! <sighs> I feel your pain, Sam. Well, folks, here we are again. Star Wars has blasted itself back onto the small screen with another Disney Plus miniseries bringing another fan-favorite character and actor back after a years-long absence. Ewan McGregor is back as Obi-Wan Kenobi following what felt like a million fan campaigns in an endless push-pull stop-start production cycle. Surely, of all the Disney Plus Star Wars we've gotten to date, this is the flagship, the most anticipated show, the one that had to be a home run after more than 15 years of waiting, right? Right? Okay, okay, hold up. My overall experience with Kenobi, I'd say it averages out as positive, I guess, maybe? You know, it's fine. Ewan McGregor returns to the part in absolute fighting form. He's clearly committed to being here again and really tries to not only revisit the character, but find a new angle from which to approach him and dig deeper into him as a person. On the same note, Hayden Christensen is doing some definitive work in his return turn as Darth Vader, to the point where even if the Ahsoka series disappoints, it'll probably be worth tuning into for him alone. And there are some genuine emotional moments throughout as well, many of which come by way of Obi-Wan grappling with losing Anakin, but which are supplemented as well by the time we spend with Leia as a child. But the writing is kind of all over the place. When this series was being developed, it was originally going to be a darker story written by Hossein Amini, who wrote this masterpiece. Instead, Disney rejected that idea and went for something that tried to be lighter in tone, while still also containing layers of darkness that were probably reworked from the original concept. The end result is a tonally inconsistent borderline mess. Is it Star Wars at its worst? No, not quite. I mean, at the very least, it is definitely better than The Book of Boba Fett, and probably Season 2 of The Mandalorian, if I'm being honest. But an Obi-Wan series should have been a grand slam. An Obi-Wan series that's instead merely okay, maybe a base hit at best, is certainly a big disappointment, and has once again left me perplexed by the sheer ineptitude of Disney and Lucasfilm. At this point, I'm very ambivalent towards Disney plus Star Wars. It almost makes me want to head into the desert and go deep into hiding from this franchise. And like Obi-Wan Kenobi, I'm gonna need to make sure I keep myself nourished and in shape with easy, healthy meals. Factor has made it possible for me to achieve my daily goals through nutritious, purposeful eating. With keto, calorie smart, and vegan plus veggie options, whether I'm in the mood for seafood, meat, or plant-based, Factor always has something to offer. And just like Obi-Wan, I don't have to waste time waiting around for my food to be ready. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and ready to eat in just two minutes. No more stressful meal planning and extensive prep time. No more Jedi trials to endure before supper. Meal plans offer a variety with a rotating weekly menu of 25 plus meal options and Factor Plus add-ons. Some of my favorite dishes are the green chili chicken and artichoke and spinach chicken dishes. Both are so freaking good. So choose your own meals or you know what? Let the experts do what they do best and let Factor craft an order for you based on your taste preferences. Factor is also flexible. I can easily adjust my order size to enjoy with loved ones or even skip a week when I have a special event. Look, I often find myself out and about either going to screenings or other, you know, events that require my attention, and Factor is a go-to lunch or dinner solution when I'm at the office, but don't just take my word for it. Try it for yourself. Head to go.factor75.com slash filmspeak120 and use code filmspeak120 to get $120 off your first order. Again, that's go.factor75.com slash filmspeak120 and code filmspeak120 for $120 $20 off your first order. And thank you so much to Factor for sponsoring this video. When we pick up with Obi-Wan Kenobi a decade after Revenge of the Sith, I think the show has doubled down on the character's hopeless state at the end of that film. Rightly so. We all wanted to see depressed Ben wandering the desert doing a bit of soul searching, beating himself up over charring his best friend just a smidge too much. The show functions as a mostly effective bridge from the state of grief and despair at the end of Revenge of the Sith towards the more optimistic, hopeful old man we later meet who's going to be able to give his life so as to ignite a new hope in the galaxy. This show presents us with how he got to where he is in A New Hope. Obi-Wan has become more numb to the state of things, jaded even. 
hiding in fear and hopelessness. He's also going through a crisis of faith as the very institution he pledged himself to and believed in crumbled before his very eyes due to their own arrogance. The Jedi lost their way during the prequels, lost what they were all about and what they believed in. It's put Obi-Wan in such a distraught state that he's cut himself off from the Force. He still, deep down, believes in the core tenets of the Jedi, but he has to learn to believe again and reawaken that belief, invest himself fully in the principles they stood for, not the institution itself, a cycle of bitterness infused with anxiety and fear. The show is trying to send Obi-Wan to a place where he can say, all right, I can't change what's done, but I can be mindful of my emotions and embrace a more pure form of the Jedi teachings. I can set the future right. And you know what? That works for me. Ewan McGregor is as terrific as he always has been as Obi-Wan, stepping back into this iconic character with the ease of putting on an old glove. He's bringing so many layers to the character from an acting standpoint, and the results are nothing short of phenomenal. He's head and shoulders above most everyone else in the series to the point where you almost wish you were watching the initial darker version of the Obi-Wan spinoff, the one Ewan is clearly tapping into. It's internal, pensive, regretful, emotionally nuanced, and deep. Even if the writing lets him down at times, Ewan McGregor steps in to do the heavy lifting and makes us feel the gamut of emotions he's going through. His metamorphosis back into a man with newfound purpose and faith is felt solely because of Ewan's soulful performance. If the show focused just a bit more on his titular character and his struggle, I actually think it would have made for a huge course correction in the overall quality of the show because when it does take time to examine Kenobi and interrogate what he stands for, that's when it's at its most interesting. After all, the Jedi are the guardians of the peace, not soldiers. Ben had to learn to be a protector again, a guardian, not a warrior. He's so hesitant to get involved at the start of the series that he's blind to his true purpose, to protect, not to fight. Even in the fifth episode, the most action-packed hour of the show, Kenobi still opts to use his intellect, wit, and ingenuity before pulling out his lightsaber or a blaster, if he even pulls it out at all. He even remarks how you don't need a weapon to fight a war. Then there's Reva, who is vengeful, reckless, entirely unhesitant in her abandon as she hunts and slaughters Jedi. She mirrors Anakin in her actions, born out of the trauma he put her through, and then her journey to redemption becomes intertwined with Ben, journey to reaffirming his faith. Ben is able to guide and teach Reva in a more empathetic and gentle way that perhaps he wasn't able to with Anakin, and his time with Leia also seems to have allowed him to find a more patient, almost tender side to his teachings. He's finally learned from his past mistakes as a mentor. The show probably missed a trick by not using Maul, who would have really been the perfect foe for Kenobi in this story, but on the other hand, Rebels filled the gaps in Maul's story too well, to the point where he probably wouldn't have fit here without breaking the storytelling in that other show, and it would have undercut the final confrontation he and Kenobi go on to have if he had made an appearance here. And for what it's worth, I still really like Reva, even if it took a little bit to warm up to her character. I like how she reflects Anakin and how that adds to Ben's arc in the process, while carving out her own compelling and poignant arc that adds even more depth and emotion to Anakin's assault on the Jedi Temple in the Order 66 massacre. Speaking of old Darth here, Anakin has always been trying to control the hearts and desires of everyone, either through intimidation, trauma, or fear, and his constant need to have his hand on everything and control everything is precisely what has always pushed people away. So here, we have two victims of an almost abusive relationship with him, Obi-Wan and Reva, and when they finally come to understand that it's him and his hubris that's the problem, not them, they're able to leave him behind and move forward. Now, could this have been handled in a more direct, less convoluted way? Oh my god, absolutely. All of this would have functioned far, far better within the confines of a feature film rather than a series. There's far too many supporting characters, moving parts, aimlessly jumping from A to B for this particular story that should have been more character-focused, more intimate. I know the irony of saying this coming off of a positive Jurassic World Dominion video, but with some stories, I think it's fair to say less is more. The show could have done a better job at tying Reva and Ben together could have put them on screen together more, but I think the point still stands that Anakin's obsessive need for control to be taken seriously in the eyes of his peers, mentors, subordinates, and even masters as we see with Sidious towards the end of the finale is not only his undoing, but the undoing of those around him. 
It's pure, unfiltered, toxically passionate, insecure rage. Anakin's the kind of guy who's outwardly like, I don't care what you think, you mean nothing to me, if you can't give him exactly what he wants. But deep down, he's really incredibly conscious and concerned about what you think and how you view him. For as much as he may have been someone of faith, he seems to have lost all of it and only trust in himself. Even that's a bit iffy because his insecurities are written all over him. It's honestly even more miraculous that Luke is later able to save his soul at all. It's pure unwavering love and innocence and doing the right and selfless thing, even in the face of certain death, that brings Anakin back. That's what Luke teaches Vader and I think by having him dig his heels in as deep as they'll go into the dark side, this show actually does more for Vader than it does any other character in the series. I mean, he's basically a slasher villain, especially in episode three. Vader is a terrifying presence, and that presence is felt in universe. Vader is already the galaxy's most feared person, and he doesn't hesitate to earn the title as he chokes and cuts down innocent civilians just to get to Obi-Wan. Now, the show serves Kenobi well enough, as it should, I mean, it's named after him for God's sake, but the way it characterizes and places Vader in its story might actually be its greatest overall success. And while we're still on the topic of the Skywalkers, I also think that Leia as a child in her place in the narrative works so well. This part of the show could have easily been a disaster. And yeah, I know that chase scene in the woods in the first episode is, oh my God, that is, whew, that's a low point for Star Wars. That, ugh. God. But the show pulls it off. You know, it pulls off the Leia stuff for the most part. Casting did an excellent job finding Vivian Blair, who looks so much like Carrie Fisher and adopts primitive forms of the late actress's mannerism so well that you could easily see her going up to play the role as an adult. Now, this is not me saying that that should happen, by the way. I just think it's a testament to how well they cast the character. And her performance is often really good as well. It may have some of the occasional pitfalls and unevenness that child performances can have, and it certainly isn't helpful when when she's being fed lines that would make a Disney Channel original movie look like a prestige picture, but overall, the show is better for having her in it. And whenever she's acting opposite Ewan McGregor, she really gets the shine. The Leia and Obi-Wan dynamic is strengthened by their adventure here. It adds more to that relationship. Kenobi launches Leia into the beginnings of her true maturity, preparing her for her future and destiny. You're 10 years old. but you won't always be. And she, in turn, reminds him of the good that he is working and fighting towards, that he can and does make a difference, that he can inspire hope, even if it's only symbolically. People still believe in the Jedi and what they stand for, and Leia helps Obi-Wan to understand that this is a responsibility he can't take lightly, as he rediscovers his faith in not only himself, but the average person as well. People may see the Jedi, and specifically Obi-Wan Kenobi, as a savior, but the real savior, the real symbol of hope, is the extraordinary acts of heroism performed by the average person, the refugees, who have everything to lose and risk it all for the lives of others. They're the future, and while we see them working tirelessly to ensure the optimal future for the entire galaxy, Obi-Wan must do his part to help best position them to succeed. He was part of the generation that messed up, got a bit too big-headed and allowed Darth Sidious and his apprentice to tear down the Republic and institute a dictatorship. Obi-Wan contributed to that, and while it certainly weighs heavily on his conscience, he has to learn to let the past die and do what he can now to improve the future. Obi-Wan learns new strength from his experiences with these remarkable individuals, and the person front and center inspiring hope and a bright future is Leia Organa. This series does so much to showcase the love and admiration Obi-Wan comes to have for Leia, and truthfully, the whole Skywalker family, despite their shortcomings. Ultimately, Leia's place in this series helps improve her role in the franchise as a whole. She's just as important to Star Wars as Luke Skywalker is. She always has been, and it was really wonderful to see this show truly embrace and reaffirm that fact. That being said, the cyclical middle section of the show, where Kenobi tracks Leia, rescues her, loses her again, finds her again, and rescues her again, could probably be mostly excised from the series, and little, if anything, would change. That fourth episode in particular, which is kind of ripped off from Fallen Order, if you think about it, really weighs against the series as a whole. It's not a good episode to begin with. We start with O'Shea Jackson Jr. doing a sudden 180 from I won't help you, Kenobi, to I'll do whatever you need, Kenobi, in less than 30 seconds. One of many strange and jarring time jumps and structuring throughout this series. The action feels very lethargic. 
Kenobi just endlessly deflecting blaster bolts with his lightsaber before two A-wing pilots we spend all of five seconds with come to the rescue, and we spend a disproportionate, almost unintentionally humorous amount of time mourning one of those pilots, Wade, when he gets shot down. But it also feels like a rehash of episode two that just takes place on the Inquisitor base rather than in a seedy underground city. And while this is a problem in the series as a whole, the absolutely generic and sometimes even boring way that the action is shot and edited together really calls attention to itself in that episode because there's just so much of it during this hour and the writing isn't strong enough to forgive such underwhelming cinematography. Like, this is Star Wars, this is Disney. Why does the action look like a deleted scene from an episode of Power Rangers? The camera movements are this weird combination of Jason Bourne style shaky cam and kinetic Dutch angles, which is fine, I guess, but it comes across more like an expensive fan film than a full-blown Lucasfilm production. I know Rogue One popularized the gritty ground level look at the state of the galaxy, but the scale of the empire and war film aesthetic of that film necessitated a different approach to the filmmaking, one where the main characters were just people not too dissimilar from ourselves. Not every show in the Star Wars canon needs to follow this template, and yet time and time again we see it used as a crutch. The Mandalorian wasn't innocent in this regard, and the Book of Boba Fett did more of the same, if, if not worse, than what we're watching in Obi-Wan here. It doesn't take much. Add some color, frame things in interesting ways, block scenes in a dramatically interesting way. It also doesn't help that the locations are insanely dark dark and uninteresting, empty desert land, the outskirts of a town, a dark plain with rocks and nothing more, underlit sometimes, inly illuminated by the glow of a lightsaber, a lazy tactic to make up for poor lighting. It's cool that the blaze are able to function as a contributing light source in the scene, but don't have it be the only light source. On top of that, there's a lack of urgency and energy in the lightsaber duel specifically. Gone are the swashbuckling acrobatics of the prequels, since apparently that was too much, even though the show is apparently a love letter to those same prequels and their stylistic trappings? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't get that. So, we just get some tap-tap laser swords for most of the series, the kind of stuff that looks barely a step above the lightsaber duel in A New Hope most of the time. And maybe this is, again, serving to bridge the gap between that epic lightsaber duels of the prequels and the more emotionally charged duels of the original trilogy, but even the original trilogy fights were interesting to watch. They utilized their surroundings, the elements were in play, and the emotional weight of the dialogue also just helped make those fights that much better. Speaking of Imperials though, I did actually love how the show expanded on the Empire and its structure with the Inquisitors and their own internal drama. It's all the power game very much in line with the Krennic stuff from Rogue One and it adds another layer of ruthlessness to the already very imposing Reva. We also get a deeper look at the life of civilians under the Empire's rule, whether it be innocent farmers who face intimidation and terror from the Empire. The show gives these people a bit of playing time without letting it hijack the narrative, and it was a refreshing point of view to add to the mythos of Star Wars. I wish the undercover agent had a bit more of an impact in the show so that her Rogue One-esque death was felt more, but Indira Varma really infused that character with both charisma and emotional depth that elevate her above what could have just been a generic double agent. I also like the effect her sacrifice has on Kenobi. It's a reminder to Obi-Wan that he can't just go in there and fight like it's still the Clone Wars. That's not him anymore. And it's never what the Jedi were or what they should have been anyway. From that same episode, episode 5, the dueling lesson as the framing device was really effective. Arguably my favorite aspect of that episode. It felt like two generals playing chess. The way Vader and Kenobi were both drawing on the same memory to try and outwit one another worked profoundly well for me. Particularly in getting one last look at Anakin in a time before the dark side took him over. What I appreciated about Obi-Wan the most in episode 5 was him initially going back into war strategist general mode, but then also reaffirming his belief in the Jedi being guardians, not soldiers. Also, the whole idea of Anakin being too headstrong, engaging in battle with nothing but aggression, inadvertently allowing Obi-Wan to continuously outsmart him is something that was at the core of his actions in that training duel on Coruscant, in their fight on Mustafar, and would finally be the crux of their last confrontation on the Death Star. In all of these situations, Obi-Wan triumphed over Vader. He always has the high ground. 
I also love how Anakin is so desperate to prove himself, so desperate to show his power that he quite literally has to toy with his prey. He has to assert his dominance. He has to be the one to deal the killing blow, even if it's not pragmatic for him to do so. It's the same kind of pride that you saw in someone like Count Dooku. They really lean into Anakin's chip on his shoulder, fawned by the Jedi Council's disapproval of him in the prequels and subsequent condescending belittling, first from losing to Dooku and later from being defeated by Kenobi as being the thing that fuels his rage. And that leads us into the finale, which, while still a little wobbly, is pretty handily one of the better episodes of the show. The time jumps are a little maddening still. We don't see Reva get off planet or anything, and then she's suddenly on Tatooine, and later on, Obi-Wan gets to Tatooine in about two minutes' time after fighting Vader, and, and I guess Vader chasing the refugees is as good a place to start otherwise. I guess that, yeah, makes sense, right? The refugees need hope, someone to give them enough time, but so does Kenobi. Leia finds comfort in her droid, similar to how the people find hope in the Jedi, and I really liked how Kenobi borrowed her droid in search of that comfort and courage so that he in turn could provide that to the refugees with the hope they needed as well. It's a good enough start until, wait, did, uh, did I miss something? There's a cutaway to Owen and Luke, and then we cut back to Leia yelling angry at Obi-Wan? What? It's almost like an entire scene had been lifted from this episode, and that's not the first time this had happened. Back in episode 4, too, it felt like entire sequences were lifted in order to just progress the narrative, which, again, has been an issue throughout this entire show. The scene placement, or lack thereof scene placement, is so bizarre. The thing about Kenobi that puzzles me the most is that while the broad strokes of the story they're telling are good, you know, they're hitting the emotional beats for the most part, the series is faltering in the departments where you would think a Star Wars movie or series would succeed. The production, the pacing, the camera work, all of this stuff. The music, for God's sake. Like, John Williams' Obi-Wan theme is fucking great, but the rest of the time, the music just feels like background noise. Music in Star Wars is a leading character, so fucking go with it. <sighs> Anyways, from there, the episode almost constantly hops between the two storylines from that point forward. Really, this episode should have just been all about Kenobi versus Vader, and then wrapped up the Reva storyline in the aftermath. That would have allowed each plot thread's conclusion to stand on its own. The climax of Obi-Wan is essentially lifted from the climax of Revenge of the Sith. Hell, the entire finale is really structured like the climax of Revenge of the Sith, because prequel nostalgia. And look, I'm a prequel fan, I like to be serviced with that kind of nostalgia, but at least make it work. Don't just do the cross-cutting for the sake of cross-cutting. When we cut back to Reva hunting young Luke, like, yeah, there's a bit of urgency, yeah, there's, you know, stakes involved, but we also know that she's not gonna kill Luke because it's Luke fucking Skywalker, so it feels like a needless attempt to imitate the Obi-Wan and Anakin duel versus the Yoda and Palpatine duel. The reason those duels work intertwined during the climax of Revenge of the Sith is because Anakin and Obi-Wan are fighting for the soul of Anakin Skywalker. We know it ends in tragedy, but still, we need to see the tipping point where Anakin fully gets engulfed by the flames of the dark side, and so that fight has a lot of emotional weight behind it, even if we know where it's going. When it comes to Yoda and Palpatine, that is quite literally a fight for the salvation of democracy. Yoda goes to take out Palpatine and destroy the Sith and the dictatorship and fails. Both Obi-Wan and Yoda are on a quest to try and salvage as much of democracy and the Jedi Order and the light side as they possibly can, and they fail. When we get to the climax of Obi-Wan, one duel has a lot more emotional weight to it, the rematch of Obi-Wan versus Vader, than Reva hunting young Luke, who we know is going to be the person who comes and saves Vader at the end of Return of the Jedi. And also, the pacing of each section is so disconnected. Every time we cut back to Reva, it just all but halts the momentum that we have from the Vader and Obi-Wan duel. Now, all that being said, I do, however, like Owen and Beru standing their ground and protecting Luke at the farm. Not running, but instead digging in and protecting what they love. I might not like the execution, but I do like the idea. Vader's arrogance, ego, hatred blinds him, especially in this last fight. 
Ben is able to use that as a tool to his advantage. He always had the high ground over Anakin. Even when Vader gains the high ground and traps Kenobi, Kenobi still pushes through with hope for the future. The moment where Obi-Wan sees flashes of Leia and Luke giving him the strength to escape his tomb was so satisfying and felt like an earned payoff to having Leia be in so much of the show to her being the thing that allows him to hang on to the good that was in Anakin while moving on from his guilt and shame over whatever part he feels he played in his fall to the dark side. He escapes because he is now fighting to protect something, to protect it, rather than for the promise of victory alone. And of course, there's the very final moments between Kenobi and Vader that are some of my favorites out of the entire series. The sound editing that merges Hayden's voice with James Earl Jones, the blue light from Kenobi's saber flashing across Vader's face for that brief moment where he seems lit stronger by it than his own red saber, only for the red light to take over as he doubles down on his embrace of the dark side. I'm sorry, Anakin. For all of it. I am not your failure, Obi-Wan. You didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. This exchange is easily the high point of the entire series. It really lends context to the way Obi-Wan talked about Anakin in A New Hope. Vader's hubris won't allow him to admit what quite literally happened to him physically, while also being right about the fact that Anakin himself turned, which caused his injuries to happen. All Anakin cares about is proving he can best his former master, and he fails every single time because it's all fueled by rage. Obi-Wan doesn't want to fight Anakin, he just has to, in hope of potentially saving him and making peace with his past mistakes. When that's off the table, there's nothing left for him. No reason to needlessly engage in a battle of hubris. And so Ben just leaves him there again, but with a clear conscience. And Ewan is just giving the scene everything he has. But so is Hayden. And I really hope the internet finally recognizes how good his work actually is as this character. But we don't really get to sit with this scene at all, despite how excellent it is, because we have to snap back to Reva fighting the Larses. There's no connection there at all. Like, I get that in episode one she was catching on that Owen might be hiding something, and Bale's message that she discovers confirms it, and this sequence does give more credence to how the Larses view themselves as Luke's parents, but the fact that Reva is fighting Owen and Baru feels kind of wrong? Those characters aren't action heroes, so to see them in some giant shootout with a Sith just feels a bit weird. And really, narratively, they're only there to stall Reva long enough for Ben to come back and save Luke anyway. I do like the fact that she's having her own epiphany because of the trauma Vader caused her as a child. Does she really want to go down that path and strike down an innocent child out of vengeance? It won't solve anything, it won't bring back her friends, it won't change the past. She makes the decision to save an unconscious Luke and return him to his family. She sympathizes with him because that boy was her 10 years earlier. I just think that Kenobi should have been the one confronting her the entire time. It would have made his final words to her, her reassurance that she is not another Vader, feel more resonant if he had to be the one to rail against and break through to her. Reva is broken because she feels she failed her friends by not killing Luke to avenge them. But as Ben says, she's given them peace. They're allowed to rest. She's honored them. The dead don't care about vengeance, after all. And, in the end, both Ben and Reva are free from the ghosts that haunt their past because of this interaction. It's a little messy because of the cross-cutting and limited shared screen time between Ewan and Moses, but I do think this worked out in the end. Even the little coda works too. Ben leaving Leia with the knowledge of how exceptional her parents were is such a beautiful and touching moment. You really see how much he loved them and admires the beautiful daughter they bore. And his proper introduction to Luke afterwards feels both earned and heartfelt. He just needs to be a boy. The future will take care of itself. Obi-Wan has finally grown into a man who's rediscovered his faith in things playing out as they are supposed to, rather than needing his constant intervention. And honestly, I wish the show ended on the hello there, even if it had been a meme ending. Things would have felt messy, but complete. But then they just had to leave Qui-Gon for the very end. He was always there. Obi-Wan just couldn't see because he lost his faith. 
but now that he's rediscovered it, he's able to commune with Qui-Gon Jinn. Now, Obi-Wan's adventure and communication with him begins, and we don't get to see a single second of it. Ugh, and that's it. It's over. Honestly, if they do do a second season, that's what I want to see. I want to see that so bad. Get rid of the Skywalkers. They don't need to be in this Obi-Wan stories. Don't use them again. Just give me that. Overall, they made the wrong show here. This feels like side quest Kenobi to me. If this six episode miniseries had instead been a movie to set up a different season one of Kenobi, one which instead followed the parts of his journey that occurs between when he meets Qui-Gon Jinn's force ghost and when Leia makes her iconic distress call to him, that might have worked a lot better. At the end of the day, what did we gain from this story? A tiny bit more context from Obi-Wan and Vader's duel and A New Hope? The start of Luke and Ben's relationship? An impetus for Leia to embrace her life as a public servant slash symbol of hope and to do her duty as she begins adolescence? How far does the needle really move from Revenge of the Sith here? The most interesting world-changing development, Obi-Wan finally receiving the promise of contact with his departed master, happens 30 seconds before the credits roll. A lot of this comes down to pacing and padding and needlessly complicating things. I do like how Reva and Ben's arcs almost formed a light dark dyad where they emerge as new people with a new purpose and their faith in themselves restored, their past laid to rest. I think that's an important aspect to both characters growing from their trauma and moving forward and it's great that the show represents this in both the light and the dark. I just feel like the show splits its time between these characters and keeps them mostly separated a little too much for it all to cohere at the end and fully have the impact the filmmakers seem to be going for. Moses Ingram did a terrific job with this part. It's just that she never fully manages to feel like a true antagonist for Kenobi. She's by her very nature an antagonist for Anakin. She's only hunting and killing Jedi along the way so that Kenobi, and we as an audience with him, has a reason to root against her. And also because if she were merely hunting Vader, she would feel completely disconnected from the larger story. The other thing with Obi-Wan Kenobi, the show, is it just felt largely uneven. And like it was often treading water only to suddenly launch into a competitive swim at times because, oh, we forgot we're longer than a movie, but our time here is still finite. This really should have been a feature film. I don't necessarily dislike how things played out overall. I don't hate this show, and it's probably the best Disney Plus Star Wars show by default for that reason, but I also think the journey to get there was unexciting, dull, kind of meh. It was inconsistent emotionally. Sometimes I really felt Ben's despair and soul searching, but often I didn't because the plot got in the way. And I also just don't think the actual filmmaking was up to par with what I would have liked to see, especially a lot of the action. I feel like that kind of sums up a lot of the series. Some really great ideas and even great scenes that are stopped short of being in the upper tier of Star Wars because the show is straining under its own weight and very little is allowed to breathe properly. There's a great quote from Carl Wilson of the Beach Boys when the band had just tried to follow up pet sounds with the incredible lush masterpiece that is Smile, but instead, at the time, put out the lo-fi hollow sketch by comparison that is Smiley Smile. He calls it a bunt rather than a home run. That's what Obi-Wan Kenobi feels like. It should have been a grand slam, the crown jewel of small screen Star Wars and a miniseries looked upon as a sublime example of the medium. Instead, it's just... Kenobi!